feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Shrimp Tank down here in Boca Raton, Florida, where street smarts and book smarts collide. I'm your host today, Jason Hill, with my co-host, Dr. Roland Kidwell. He's the director at the FAU Adam Center for Entrepreneurship. As everyone has noticed, we're switching over to these fireside chats due to coronavirus and making sure that we get these entrepreneur stories out to everyone in our audience. So remember, support your small businesses, support your local businesses. It is so important today you know, more than ever to make sure you shop local and support them so they're not out of business. I think the last stat I read, you know, 52% of businesses might be under in 12 months. So how valuable is it right now to support your local community? Roland, tell us what's happening on your end. I see you got a haircut. You're starting to- I got another out. haircut supporting small business today. Uh, check out my Instagram page, the shrimp doctor and, uh, find out who cut my hair and uh, have her come over and uh, make a house call if you like it well people like it already looking good it's better than my haircut when i did this well, you I, do that I yourself cut the half huh? off i cut a, a slot in the back i think it's time for me to get a real real haircut when uh when i get out into the open soon so what's happening up at you Anything well i like heard that 80 percent before this happened i heard that 80 percent of people who could work at home wanted to work at home but they weren't sure if they were want their kids there while they were doing it. So they, they have to reevaluate the reevaluate the uh, the survey there. But uh, we're holding our own over here. I'm real pleased that we have I have uh, one of our colleagues uh, today, uh, Dr. Siri Turgeson, to talk a little bit about some things we're doing at FAU as well. And uh, we're uh, in the middle of a summer semester, and we're doing a lot of interesting things and gearing up for the fall, and uh, still kind of plugging along so that's kind of working have you guys right opened now. up the campus to any type of events yet or not yet not yet um there may be some events going on we're going to be social distancing we are having some meetings you know in a room for 80 people we got about 10 12 14 in there so sure. it's a logistics uh, process to figure out uh, putting together the classes where maybe a few students can come in and uh, the majority might watch on TV in a synchronous uh, class and then maybe going to online classes for several other things, but trying to give the students when they arrive a college experience that they didn't come to college, like I said last time, yeah. to uh, necessarily uh, go to class all the time. There are other elements as well. And so that's what we're kind of kind of working on. One thing I wanted to, to ha ask uh, Siri to talk about before, Maybe uh, when she does the um, her intro, maybe a little bit about the i uh, over here, what we're doing there with that program and how that's working with um, some of the new tech we're trying to get out commercialized. Maybe she'll talk about that in a little bit. But other than that, let me just step out of the way here and let, uh, let our guests go down the line and sure. what, give them an elevator pitch. Yeah, so our audience listening, if you want to catch 100 plus episodes, we're all up on iTunes, iHeartRadio, or on our website, the Boca Raton, shrimptankpodcast.com. We featured 100 plus local entrepreneurs in South Florida, so it's pretty unique to get an hour-long episode with all these amazing entrepreneurs. So let's kick things off. We always start with our past guest. You know, we're going to go around in a circle, and for a minute or two, I guess, tell us about your company and what you guys are up to right now. So Jonathan Beskin. His signature is up on this wall somewhere. Every, every time a guest comes in, we ask them to put their, their autograph up here and also their favorite motivational quote. And uh, it's pretty unique that Jonathan had the experience in our live studio. So Jonathan, tell us about you know, where you are today. You came in, I think, really early on in the, when we were in the 30s you know, on our podcast. And I, I've seen extreme growth with your company. I've seen some awards that you guys have won on the Inc. 500 list. Tell us what's going on. Yeah, uh, thanks for inviting me. Glad to uh, be here. And uh, so Single Swag is my primary business, and it's a monthly subscription, subscription service designed for single women. Uh, we currently ship over 45,000 boxes a month to about 30 different countries. Uh, we acquire uh, customers via uh, social media advertising, primarily on Facebook and Instagram. And we've seen a dynamic uh, shift in the last couple of months where the acquisition costs has come down substantially. And it's allowed us to scale uh, in this environment at a very exciting rate. Uh, people are more comfortable getting a box delivered to their home. We're taking a lot of safety precautions at our 
uh, third party facility. Uh, in addition to that, I've started a few other uh, businesses that have come as a result of single swag scale. I have a cosmetics company uh, called Molly Jacob that has national distribution. I have a jewelry brand called Violet Harper. And I recently acquired another subscription service called Paradise Delivered. Uh, which is also a great timing and exciting name uh, because people may not be able to go on vacation uh, uh, as much as they normally would in kind of a normal environment. And we're very excited about that company as well. Well, that's a great name because our big event for Global Entrepreneurship Week is Entrepreneurs in Paradise. So we might have to talk, you know, if we do our yeah. event again in November, it's a great collaboration, of course. Uh, why don't we start with Surrey, you know, at FAU, you know, tell us, you know, your background, you work with Roland. Uh, as well, you're the associate dean at FAU. Tell us what's what's uh, on your plate this year and what's well, what you've been up to in the past. Thank you so much. I'm just honored to be here with all you great South Florida entrepreneurs, and I look forward to the rendezvous in person. Um, as Jason mentioned, I joined FAU this past August. Um, I knew Roland, John, Kevin, some of the other entrepreneurship faculty you've, you've gotten to know for many years, and um, I will tell you, FAU is the best place in the world to work, especially as an entrepreneurship faculty member. Um, I'm Associate Dean here in charge of research and external relations, so um, looking for great strategic partners and all the different pieces we're doing. We actually just got ranked by the Financial Times, number one in Florida for exec ed, number 11 in the U.S., so we're hoping to do some more offerings there. As Roland mentioned earlier, we're also one of about 80 to 90 college campuses across the country that have an NSF i site that's housed in Tech Runway, and that's where we've seen a lot of tech um, businesses launch. In fact, just before we jumped on the show, we just got three more applications in for the regional i -Corps. So um, what I love about FAU is obviously we're living here in paradise with lots of terrific entrepreneurs, but we've also got wonderful entrepreneurial students and we're trying to put them in the way of opportunities and just work with you. So I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And jo Jonathan, are you an FAU alumni? I forget. I am, yeah. I went to yep. uh, undergrad at Florida State, and I have a, I'm a graduate of the Executive uh, MBA yep. program in 2015. Awesome, I thought so. Okay, Lauren, uh, tell us about what you're up to. I, I see your emails all the time on the newsletter, you know, and I I know you're doing a lot of work with small businesses right now, making sure you know they they get approved for the payment protection plan. Tell us what's happening. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Jason. It's nice to be here and meet some new people. Roland, nice to see you. Um, I'm Lauren Cohen. I'm originally from Canada, hence the Canadian thing in the background there. And proud to be from Canada these days, I must admit. So um, I'm an international lawyer and a cross-border expert. I help people and companies move all around the world, essentially helping them invest, live, work, and play anywhere that they desire. And as Jason mentioned, when this all started, I had to pivot my own business, and now I'm helping others pivot theirs because obviously people aren't really moving when there's a global pandemic going on. I can't even get home to Toronto. So, um, so I was helping people and still am helping people access the SBA loans and the, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program and making sure that they walk, were, walk through that mess of a process um, as simply and strategically as possible. I'm also a licensed realtor and I'm part of a really amazing team and organization. So. I really work with a lot of real estate investors. And I think that that's where my business is going to go going forward is working with these real estate investors and entrepreneurs coming into not only Florida, but all around the country. I've worked with the Tech Runway. I've worked with FAU many times. And we can certainly have a conversation, Siri and Roland, about how to do that. I've been writing business plans for 20 plus years. We won't go into that. Um, and I'm still a lawyer in Canada and a lawyer in the States. And I really love working with with entrepreneurs and helping them see their dreams through. When people ask me what excites you, it's really about that. I mean, it sounds strange. It would, you know, I, I loved it when people would get their money. Actually, a client today just got her loan and she said, what do I do? I'm like, take it. <laughs> it take it. Let's go. What's next step? So thank you for having me. And I look forward to getting to know you guys. Thank you. Well, my gut is telling me that you're going to be busy down the road because there's a lot of New Yorkers, that's why they call this place the Sixth Borough, you know, and our <laughs> guest, Michael, you know, is an example of that. I mean, I have so many friends that are texting me and calling me that they're they're going to give Florida a test run this summer, thinking about moving down here. And then we had Je uh, Jessica Del Vicchio. Uh, she's yeah. the economic development manager of Boca Raton. And 
She, she's seeing more and more calls coming through and emails of businesses considering South Florida. Of course, you know, what better place where you have a college, you know, locally, you know, so it's, it's nice to be able to hire those students for your business. Uh, and then on top of that, the beach, the warm weather, you know, and air, multiple airports, you know, so it really is going to become, I think, you know, busier and busier. So I think uh, you're going to, you're going to see the reward down the road. And let's go over to Michael, because that's exactly what Michael has done. You know, Michael and I connected on LinkedIn. I don't know where I see him keep posting and posting. And I, I saw this entrepreneur exploding. I'm like, whoa, whoa, this is a pretty awesome story. And I just reached out on LinkedIn. And then I know where he's like, actually, I'm expanding to Fort Lauderdale. And that's when I said, well, why don't you come on the shrimp tank? You know, and, and we look forward to having Michael in the in-person studio as well. So Michael, tell us about uh, your company. Yeah, I mean, first off, it's, it's been a long time coming. So yeah, I think the yeah. first time we were supposed to be scheduled sometime last year and, and couldn't make it work because I'm always going up and down, you know, between New York and, and New Jersey and, and back and forth. So even, even in LA, I, I lived in LA for a little bit. So it's, it's good to finally be able to make it here and, and, and have me on. So appreciate it. Um, I think I'm probably the only one here without a college degree, probably. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, so I've always been entrepreneurial growing up you know, ever since I'm four or five years old, there's pictures of me outside my house selling whatever I could find in my house over to my neighbors. Um, you know, it extended into baseball cards and eBay, you know, very Gary Vaynerchuk type style uh, growing up. He's another New Jersey guy. And, you know, in, in college, I, I went to William and Mary to, to study finance and, and thought that was the path for me. I went, you know, I worked at a hedge fund when I was 18 and, you know, I was going to be a financial advisor. And then my buddy came to me with this app idea while we were in school. And, and it really got me back on the entrepreneurial journey and, and path to like, back to where my roots kind of were. Um, and ever since there, I haven't stopped again. You know, I, I dropped out of school to become business partners with an NFL player. You know, this guy, Steve Weatherford from, from the New York Giants. And, you know, we were creating fitness training programs and supplements and, you know, lots of content. And, and we did really, really well. And then after a year of that, um, went to a VC fund for about three months, you know, we we're advising and, and investing in startups in the hospitality tech space. And being around startups again, you know, I had this experience in college where I learned about custom printing and t shirts and flags and all that kind of stuff to put up around campus to pr promote the app. And being around startups at this VC fund, I just I just saw how passionate companies were about their brand, you know, they get funding, one of the first things they do is, you know, they get swag for their team or for their, um, you know, for their clients or prospects, whatever it might be, but there was no brand that really stood out that was doing it well, and was doing it in a way that understood how startups work. Um, and, and that's where we kind of inserted ourselves, you know, you have these companies like Custom Inc. and Four Imprint and ePromos that are these big behemoth like e-commerce sites, but they don't really have any sort of personalization or add-on services and they make it really hard to find stuff there's just too many options and on the other side you have these agencies that are very hands-on expensive to work with you know take a long time to deal with um, so we wanted to kind of play somewhere in the middle and, and we originally called it startup swag uh, it evolved into swag up and you know one of our first clients wanted to put together one of these boxes similar to like what you, you guys are doing at single swag like one of these membership subscription boxes and they wanted to do it for all their new hires and it was a $10,000 order. It was the biggest order that we had ever had at the time. It was the biggest, probably single transaction in my life, you know, <laughs> at the moment. Because uh, I'm, I'm only 25 now. When I started the company, I was 22. Um, and, and we saw that and just saw that there's a huge opportunity here to streamline this, like, supply chain and make it really simple for companies to put together these boxes, you know, of custom bread and merchandise to give to new hires, prospects, customers, whatever it might be. Um, so that we became, you know, we, that became our niche and our purple cow into the market. Um, and really kind of wedged ourselves into corporations. And, you know, over the next few years, we started to really uncover all the ways that corporations de purchase and distribute swag and branded merchandise and all the kind of pitfalls and operational sure. headaches. And, you know, since then, we've built out a, a software engineering team of about 32 people. We have 65 employees total, 32 of them, half of them on the you know engineering side. And we've began building out this API first platform where, you know, companies can manage this entire process and integrate into their, you know, purchase order systems and HRIS systems and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, that's what we've been doing. It's been three years now. We just had our three-year anniversary a, a couple of weekends ago. Uh, we're at about 1,300 clients and, and growing. And it's, you know, it's been really busy over the last couple months now with, with COVID, just given that companies are really want to stay engaged with their teams and, and their customers and they want to be sending stuff out to them, especially since they can't sure. like do events and they're not going to meet them in person. And we have the backbone and logistical capabilities to like handle all of the distribution and, and give them a platform to do it. So 
Um, we've been really, really busy and, and we're continuing to scale up. You know, and where do all your employees work? Are they all in New York City, uh, Fort Lauderdale, or really you design the company that it's in the cloud and everyone's working from home? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, when I started the company, I started out of my mom's house in New Jersey originally. Then, you know, I, I met my girlfriend and we moved to LA and I was running the business there, but I had a buddy of mine running the operation in New Jersey. We had a small little 2,300 square foot warehouse. Um, and then from there, it kind of just branched out because we were able to find really great tech town in Florida. You know, our CMO, um, Helen, she's from Fort Lauderdale. She's worked at some startups over there. She, you know, acquired, you know, maintained relationships with great, you know, CTOs and backend engineers. And that's where we developed kind of our core engineering team. And from there, we built out the office there. But, you know, the majority are in New Jersey because like, you know, fulfillment staff and operations team, but core employees are kind of all over the place. And we just hired a director of sales out of Kansas yeah. City. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're embracing remote more um, now than ever. So, Of course. Roland, do you have a question for one of our guests? I was going to ask Jonathan, too. He said he was having some kind of an upturn as well in the last few months. Is this the same kind of... Um, thing Michael is experiencing with the uh, companies want to stay in contact or is it something else? Was that question for me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Okay. What, what was, what's the source of your upturn? You, the, the, the things have been going pretty well in the last couple yeah. months. So uh, it's, uh, I mean, the one variable that's changed uh, most significantly is the cost of acquisition. Uh, so essentially we've been spending over 15,000 a day on Facebook ads and Instagram ads for the past two years. Uh, and we have a pretty consistent acquisition cost with that spend. Uh, what's happened, I would say, in the last two months is that we're able to acquire, uh, in a lot of days, more than double the amount of subscribers for the same uh, cost uh, that we were prior to that. And a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, so Facebook advertising is an auction market. And so the, the companies spending the most are getting the most eyeballs typically. So, you know, we're advertising to a pretty broad range of women uh, between about 25 and 50. Uh, so there are companies like apparel, uh, high-end uh, luxury items, uh, airlines, uh, cruise ships that would, in a normal environment, uh, advertise to those uh, individuals uh, that pulled their money out. Uh, and that allowed us uh, to kind of scale at a real um, uh, rapid rate. Uh, and I, uh, you know, it, it, it was exciting, but it also created a lot more operational work uh, because we're getting most of the product that goes in the boxes is coming from overseas. It's a combination of product that we produce ourselves uh, from our own internal brands and from established brands that are sold in department stores, that type of thing. But regardless, it's being made overseas for the most and it's about a 90 to 120 day uh, turnaround time. So we weren't able to uh, kind of get product immediately to kind of meet that demand. So uh, for the first time, we actually sold out of boxes and we pivoted to a welcome box. Uh, so now when someone initially signs up, uh, instead of getting that month's box, they received the welcome box. Uh, and it also allowed us to kind of get rid of a lot of excess inventory that we had a uh, accumulated over the past four years so uh, but it's pretty exciting exciting time so you're us. not drop shipping you're bringing it into a headquarters in florida and then you're putting sending it out from there yeah so we actually uh we've always worked with a third party uh fulfillment center uh we actually work with another uh uh currently we work with jan uh who i know everybody mm -hmm. knows from the uh the, the shrimp tank and fau uh, so uh, we moved, we were with a facility in Ohio uh, for about three years. When the contract ended with them, uh, we moved to Fort Lauderdale. One of the reasons we moved to Fort Lauderdale is because we wanted to be able to go to the facility to have more of an awareness of what was going on. What's happened, unfortunately, uh, I mean, fortunately, Shipmunk is operating. Uh, we're able to operate our business, uh, but we're not able to go there um, anymore for, you know, at the current time for safety reasons, that type of thing. But yeah, so basically everything is being delivered to Shipmunk and we're shipping all over the world uh, from Shipmunk. Mm -hmm. now, companies like TJ Maxx, Marshalls, they're all closed. So are you able to get a lot of your product at a cheaper rate? The closeouts that make sense for your boxes, I'm assuming, on that end too? Uh, yeah, we, we've had some closeout uh, opportunities with, with a lot of companies. There's a lot of companies that, um, you know, traditionally work with larger retailers uh, like those that uh, have had some uh, opportunities. And the quantities that we need 
a lot of times these companies don't have. I mean, we're ordering in over 40,000 um, unit uh, quantities right now as a minimum. So most of it is being uh, produced for us. Uh, but we have had some opportunities uh, recently where we've been able to get some inexpensive stuff quickly sure. uh, because it was already here in, in that type of situation. And to piggyback from your story over to Michael, because there's a lot of similarities. Uh, Michael, uh, how do you handle your shipping? Do you use a third party? Do you do it yourself in, a, in your own warehouse? Tell us on your end. Yeah, I, I mean, a little bit differently. Like we've always found it valuable to kind of control as much of the process as possible. Um, so, so we set out, you know, I started it out of my house, like I was saying, and that was our uh, original fulfillment center. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't that we were a huge distribution business at the beginning because it was a lot of just like bulk swag needs to like offices. So you're sending a big box out to Facebook's headquarters. Like it wasn't like sending thousands of individual boxes. So it was manageable. And we also kind of uncovered the need for distribution and, and storage over time with dealing with more companies. So we kind of like stumbled into it uh, and we just needed some more space. And, you know, similar to Jonathan, like I think it, it's a little difficult because there's so many touches involved with the packages, you know, you have the box comes from lots of different suppliers. You have different items going in it. You know, clients have specific needs of how they want it kind of done. You know, and sometimes it's, you know, clients are sending in a third party item from their headquarters to be included. So there's just, you know, it's a little easier for like single swag boxes because they're 45,000 uniform boxes. It's a lot of, you know, it's, it's a lot of boxes, which makes it difficult, but it's 45,000 uniform ones. Whereas we have, you know, 100 to 200 different boxes on a monthly basis for all different types of companies. And I'm just, you know, starting out, it didn't feel, I didn't feel comfortable handing that off to another company. It felt like it was too kind of difficult to manage and even yeah. communicate that to companies. Like how would we even communicate that to a third party fulfillment center where it'd be efficient and they do it correctly. Um, and we've always wanted to have oversight over the quality of the items, you know, given the fact that these are all custom branded, there's a lot of room for mistakes to happen from the sure. suppli you know, suppliers in terms of prints not being the correct color. They're not you know, straight or there's scratches or something like that. So we do a whole rigorous kind of quality check as it comes in. Um, and it just seemed like it was either going to be too expensive or just too many touches from like a third party to handle that process. So, so we've continued to scale it up. And now we're about to move into either a 30 to 50,000 square foot warehouse in the next few months. Um, you know, as this will be the third warehouse that we've had now. And, you know, I think we'll continue to, to own that, but then we'll eventually break off that part of the business as like a separate kind of fulfillment business. Swag Up will just become a, a customer of it and that fulfillment business can service some other businesses as well. Um, but that, that's probably how we will we'll end up kind of separating it over time. Lauren, uh, let me shift gears a little bit, ask you a question. Um, you're, yeah, there you go. Your mic's not muted anymore. <laughs> so you did sort of a involuntary pivot over into real estate or maybe you're moving in that direction. Could you give us a sense of uh, South Florida real estate market, what the outlook might be um, in the oh next uh, few months, two years? Any thoughts on that? Wow, that's a loaded question. So I've actually had my real estate license for 12 years and I've always been a referral agent and continue to be a referral agent, but now I'm also earning money as a residual income through my real estate license. And real estate has always been a big part of my business because I work with so many, I mean, a lot, especially Canadians. And since obviously I'm Canadian, I work with a lot of Canadians, but I work with people from all over the world, but lots and lots of Canadians and Brits and Brazilians, you know, we, we all know, invest in Florida and all over the country in Ohio and Vegas and Atlanta and uh, Detroit. So, um, I always, that's why I got my real estate license in order to be able to support them. But, um, the, but I, I felt that as this was coming, I actually start at, before it happened, I created a brand new landing page and I've been helping as Jason knows people to scale up their businesses and put the strong foundation in place. The challenge is with a lot of these real estate investors, they don't realize, especially if they're from another country that they may need and it may it may not even be a want they may need an investor visa to be able to come and visit their properties and who knows what's going or or their deals to close deals to to buy into businesses to do vc work anything and who knows what's going to happen after this and that the the opportunity is 
I'm working with a very big influencer from Calgary right now. We're just finalized. We just finalized his visa and he's going to, he's, he's a very big entrepreneur. He doesn't want to move. His kids play hockey. He has no interest in moving, but he needs that visa in order to manage his business. So here we are in Florida with opportunities galore. The real estate market is super strong right now. As crazy as that sounds, people, it is still a seller's market. People are buying. There's not enough inventory. This is not. This is not across the nation, and it's not even across Florida. But in South Florida, it. This is there. There's not a huge amount of inventory. Maybe because people don't want people visiting their homes. Who knows? But there's not a lot of inventory, so there's more demand than supply. So now it's still a seller's market. What that will change? There's going to definitely be. We know short sales, foreclosures, a lot of stuff that's going to open up. But we, the, the investors need to start looking now, not to wait until the bottom falls out. It's kind of like the stock market. You don't wait until it hits the very bottom. You take advantage of the opportunity as it's there because you may, the bottom may not happen. And so you miss the opportunity. And there are good deals out there, not, notwithstanding the fact it's a seller's market. So if you're looking for an opportunity, we have, you know, that this is the time. Don't, don't wait for everybody to... Don't wait for everybody to lose their shirts, so to speak. Is this investment in residential as well as commercial? Or commercial? commercial is even better. Now, mm. who knows what's going to happen to the commercial market? I, I was doing, I think you may remember this from when we met EB5, which is the program of the foreign investors invest. They were investing half million or a million. Now it's 900,000 or 1.8 million and raising capital for tons of hotels and multifamily and mixed use and so on. And, um, so what's going to happen is like a lot of those deals fell apart and a lot of people that own commercial buildings have lost their shirts and those commercial buildings are definitely going to be available at like literally fire sale prices. Mm -hmm. So if, the, if you have extra cash, maybe buying cruise stocks and airline stocks is, is one good idea. And certainly that's going to be where Jason comes in. But buying real estate is, is, I think, always a good idea. And I'm originally from Toronto. And let me tell you, there's no bottom there. Mm. Toronto real estate is, is insane. However, now is the time to invest in real estate in Canada, too, because the dollar, the U.S. dollar mm. is so high. So mm -hmm. there's opportunities everywhere. And I think it's just a matter of figuring out, instead of looking at this all as doom and gloom, figure out how to look at it as an opportunity. Pivot your business a little bit. You know, that like, like Jonathan was saying, now people are, the, the cost of acquisition is lower. Well, there's another reason I think people are on Facebook all the time. So they're, they're more prone to respond to your ads. I just started doing my own Facebook ads and uh, like out of, I think there were like 30 leads. I'm, I'm not doing a $15,000 a day thing, but out of 30 leads, 20, 22 of them are, are serious leads. They're not moving today, but now is the time to put your plan in place. You, you know, you have to have a plan and then you have to execute it. You can't plan the day before you want to make the investment or make the move. Create the strategic plan and let's put it into place and figure out how to implement it. Mm -hmm. Siri, well, let me ask question you one. For Siri. Oh, I got one. You got one? Sure. I got one for Siri. Um, Siri, the, the, you know, looking at the economy, I know you've done research in this area where Sorry, you have, I see, I knew this was going to happen. I said, Siri, here's my phone going on. Blame my mother. Hi, Siri, I, I should have warned everybody about this <laughs> iPhone. So. Anyway, that happens all the time around here. Uh, so the, um, the, the economy now, in, traditionally in a bad time, it's been good for entrepreneurs. Could you talk a little bit about the, the research you've done in that, but also what you might expect to happen in terms of opportunity and new businesses, new ventures in this seemingly bad time? Kind of following Thank you, up Roland. You know, as, as everyone was talking, I was making notes because we've had actually nine recessions over the last century, and we have a ton of research in the last recession, right? 2008, when the bottom went out, 2009. Um, and of course, that's a different type of recession or economic slowdown as what we're headed into now. But those points that you made earlier, one, you can acquire assets at a lower cost. And we used to talk about physical assets like the real estate, but I loved the example of the Facebook ads because that is an, that's an asset that 
we didn't value really the last time there was a recession and now that is it. And, it, and I smiled as, as you said that because I never bought anything that showed up on Facebook before. And uh, I just ordered a bunch of bar stools from an ad that I saw. And, uh, and so, yes, there's more eyes and there's more willingness. And then I want to make the point, and I think Lauren really drove this home and, and you're all illustrating this, you can get really good in this period. And that's where some of the research by many folks has been around how do you optimize and develop these routines? You know that you're bootstrapping um, because you may experience some, so we're separately doing some research here at the university with the entrepreneurs who are going through this, trying to apply for PPP. But we know that the angel investors are sometimes backing out. They're saying, I can make a lot more in the stock market. I'm not sure where your market is. So um, you're, you're having to bootstrap sometimes a little bit more, certainly in the last couple of recessions. And that gets you developing these routines and of course, I just want to find, you know, conclude with this. You can get really good in recession. So Hyatt, Southwest, um, Estee Lauder, all of these firms were founded in prior recessions. And um, there's a real opportunity here for new business models. Mark Cuban's been one to, to illustrate that. But we've certainly seen it in the research. Um, and I'm excited to see it in practice. And I, I think South Florida is home to a lot of great entrepreneurs and innovative ideas and when we're talking about where those next models come from, you guys are great examples. Can I say something also to add sure. to what Siri's saying? By the way, Siri, you must get a lot of flack about your name. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things I've noticed, I'm very active in the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial community. And one of the things I've noticed, or one of the things that I think will come out of this is greater emphasis on joint venturing and affiliate relationships mm -hmm. and strategic partnerships. Because I think that, that the people, those of us that have those strong relationships, those bonded relationships, I was on the marketer's cruise in, right before this nightmare. And, it, and the, the, the relationships there, because people, you know, people have lists and then they're, they're like con consolidating their lists and combining their lists. And you know, like here, here's two guys in this screen that could potentially be amazing joint venture strategic partners here. Um, Michael and Jonathan and you know there's a lot of opportunity to build together because you have commonality and I think that the kindness of, of this is is coming out of it's really going to help uh, uh, inspire that even more and I think people are also more open and if they're not they need to be because if you're going to think in a box coming out of this and think that it's going to go back to what it was before you're crazy sorry no offense but that it, you're it's not it's never going to um so i think we have to think about what 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 we are open to and how how we can help each other because in helping each other it brings it it really helps the, the group now we are we immediately when all this happened took one of our salespeople and put them into a partnerships role because we knew that every company, especially ones that are struggling are going to be open to some sort of partnership. You know, they're going to want to be able to leverage our, you know, audience and network, or we're going to be able to, we're going to want to be able to leverage their audience and give them a new revenue stream or something. Just everybody's a lot more open to collaborating right now because they have the time either, right. or they need new income sources. So, so we've, we've established partnerships with a company like Platters, which is a big office catering company. And now since they can't do in office catering, they're looking for new revenue streams. So they're partnering with a bunch of different companies and created this marketplace of services and different offerings. Um, and one of them is us. So now their clients like Wix and Lemonade Insurance is coming to us to be able to put together, you know, swag packages and care packages for all their employees and taking the budget that they would have been spending on you know, catering in office and allocating it to something like us. And, and I actually just wrote a tweet yesterday that, you know, is very similar to what you're just saying. I was like, I'll, I'll read it word for word. It said, old business was about exclusivity, restrictions, lack of transparency, isolationism, and scarcity. And new business is about openness, inclusiveness, collaboration, and abundance. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to, you have to take on that mindset of like, we're all, there's so much market out there. And the more open you are to working together and sharing resources and, and being one to collaborate, those are the companies that are going to win. And the ones that kind of like shelter in and try to like save it all for themselves, those are the ones that, that are going to get passed up in the next you know, decade. So I'm, I'm all about collaborating right now. Which is exactly how we met, right? You're very open on LinkedIn. So can you touch on LinkedIn? You know, so many business owners don't post on LinkedIn, don't, don't talk on Twitter because lots of times it's a PR nightmare. 
right? But you're active you every are. single week. So tell us about what you're up to on LinkedIn and kind of dive a, a bit deeper on that end. Well, yeah, I mean, I started posting on LinkedIn like two and a half, three years ago, like right when it was starting to become like a content platform. Because the longest time, it was just like a resume depository and you, yeah. you, know, you meet other people and, and you, you learn about if you should hire this person or not, or I need to get a job. But it, it was very much not content centric. And then over the last three years, it became very much about content. And there was huge opportunities for people that you can write just a little basic you know, word post of a few sentences. And as long as it's somewhat decent, you'd get it in front of 10,000 people. I had posts that I wrote, they were very simple. They got in front of 100,000, 200,000 people, just very basic, you know? And it's because of like the way, you know, similar to like what John's talking about, like the market on Facebook, the algorithm on LinkedIn was very advantageous for people that write content because they wanted to promote that. They wanted to get people writing and engaging and staying on the platform longer. Um, so they were really rewarding content creators for that. So I started writing a little bit and then you would see people like Gary Vaynerchuk getting in there and starting to like, you know, talked about it to everybody. Hey, LinkedIn's the place to be. LinkedIn's the place to be. So I've, I've always been, I, I wasn't super consistent for like a year, like last year, but I've started to get back into it because every post I write, you know, you get so much engagement, so many connections, so many things come out of it. I'm constantly DMing with people. I get on calls. I, I put my email out there. I put my cell phone out there because I'm very much about, again, openness and collaboration. If you have the, you know, frankly, like the balls to reach out and call my cell phone, then I'm going to answer and take your conversation. You know, and if you're going to just email me out of the blue, you know, with something like I, I love, I love people like that to take initiative. And I love, and that's why I, you know, our mentor, my mentor um, from this company, um, Wade, he's actually from South Florida and I met him on Shaper, which is the business networking app. Um, and you know, he's a, he's, he lives down in Coral Gables and he's been instrumental in the success of our business. So I think the more that you're out there, the more good things happen to you, the more lucky you get. I, I, I don't like people that say like luck is so, you know, it's just happenstance. You know, you, you get luckier the more you do things. Um, and the more you're out there and connecting with people, the more times you're going to get lucky. And, and I think it's huge. And, you know, if you're not taking advantage of LinkedIn, you're just wasting a really great opportunity. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I had a call this week that someone fell in love with the shrimp tank and they just called my office line in New York. My office line, you know, gave them my phone number because how often do people really call, you know, the phone number on there, right? And and all of a sudden I'm having an hour call with him and he just created a startup and, you know, he knows a lot of people. And I was like, wow, this is a legitimate phone call. And now he connected me, you know, with someone else and we might collaborate on a big project for the shrimp tank over in Meisner Park. So yeah. it's, it's pretty awesome you know to be open-minded on linkedin it's so crazy how quickly it's it's but so crazy yeah. how quickly people can become your best friend and and how and how quickly things transpire amongst people you know it, yeah. it, within days and minutes you just people like to good people like to help good people and and you i'll do yeah. anything for you if, if if i can sense that you're a good person and Absolutely. it doesn't matter if i knew you for a day or for 10 years you know and i, I just like to find other people like that yeah. So let's switch gears for the last 15, 20 minutes. I want each of the guests to each ask a question to one another. So Siri, do you have a question for one of the guests today? Oh my gosh. I have so many questions. I guess, you know, I'm looking at my Facebook feed and I've got some friends watching this and I know that I know a lot of people who might like to start a business in South Florida. So that would be my first question. What do you wish you'd known before setting up shop here in South Florida? And I'm happy to direct that at anyone who'd like to take that. I think Jonathan, yeah, you, you have to take this one. Michael just moved down here. So go ahead, Jonathan. <laughs> business in Florida. Yeah. So I guess uh, my business is uh, kind of global. Uh, so we uh, operate, we have an office in Boca, uh, which really has not been uh, uh, operating as an office. We've been working remotely. Uh, but I think it, it's kind of a, a budding uh, entrepreneurial community. Uh, would I say that there's, you know, some, some more things happening for a business like mine in a place like LA, uh, potentially, uh, or New York City, uh, uh, possibly, but, uh, uh, you know, there are some uh, uh, tax implications in the state of Florida, uh, some sales tax implications, which have had somewhat of an impact uh, on our business and our actually ability to sell and kind of how we scale and how we think about that within the state of Florida. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, we've been able to identify some uh, great talent uh, that's, that's joined our team. And, 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, Florida is kind of all I know. Uh, I grew up in, in South Florida. I went to school at Florida State, FAU. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I, I like to support uh, South Florida uh, organizations. I'm also in entrepreneurs organization uh, in the South Florida chapter. And I'm you know, excited to be that and collaborate with some really uh, uh, impressive people in that group. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of it. And I could answer this question as well. I moved down here in March of 2017, and I had a transition where I had a business in New York, and then I was shifting to create a, you know, another side of our business in South Florida. And one thing, if I look back, I would, I would have, you know, tried to get in front of people like Lauren or yourself, Suri, and ask questions because you guys know everything about like the taxes. Like I got a knock on my door, and they're like, "Oh, yo, taxes for Boca Raton." I was like, "I'm like, I didn't know. I did my LLC, and you just don't know as a small business owner." That these things even exist. You go to websites, it's in a foreign language, you read them, and it just doesn't make sense most of the time. And it's smart people making mistakes, and it happens to everyone. And then, you know, you just got you got to get used to the atmosphere down here. When you come from New York City and you walk out on the street at 9 p.m., it's flooded with business folks. Down here, the parking lots kind of empty out at 5:30, which kind of Remember, when you hire folks, you know, you're not going to expect them to work until 9 p.m. to get the job done. Right. You know, they're off to, to happy hour, you know, at 530. So that's been a hard transition on my end, you know, just kind of the, the same style of work ethic down here. And Michael, I, I want you to jump in on this because you're new to this. How, how has it been, you know, you know, swapping over to Florida? Has it been an adjustment or, or not so much because it's kind of like you're in the cloud anyway, I guess, you know, with a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, we're lucky in the sense that you know, our Florida employees are largely engineers and they're just so focused, you know, they don't care about the beach. They don't care about going golfing. You know, they're, they, they, if they're passionate about the project, they'll, they'll code for 20 hours a day, you know, and our, our CTO is a great leader and, and he's from Weston um, and, and they all crush it. And we have, you know, our UI UX designer, he lives down in Brickle. Um, and we're very flexible too. Like, I don't care if you work from 4 AM to 10 AM and go to sleep the rest of the day. Like, we all kind of work asynchronously and kind of get our work done. Um, and I think Florida kind of has that mentality too. It's similar to LA and like, you know, you can kind of dictate your work life balance in a way. Um, so I think that the types of employees that we hire there like the fact that we're so flexible and it's not like so rigid, like JP Morgan Chase, get in the office at 7 a.m. and you're going to stay till 10 p.m. Um, and I personally, I love golf. I love going down to Florida. I love being there. I love to, I'll get out in the middle of the day and go play golf and then I'll come back and work till 10 PM. So I think there's something about being in Florida that incites that level of creativity and flexibility to like kind of own your own kind of schedule. Um, in, in contrast to New York where everything is just hit the pavement, hit the pavement. Very, it's very rough here. Yeah. You know, it's, it's high expectations and high kind of stress uh, environment. Um, so, you know, we, we've considered moving everything to New York. It's, I mean, to Florida, it's just hard that we have some really great staff here from an operation standpoint, and it's going to be hard to get them all to move down there. Um, but from a, from a cost perspective, it's way better, you know, and from a real estate cost perspective, like, you know, Lauren was talking, there's way better opportunities for us to buy warehouses out in, in South Florida than there are up here near New York yeah. city, you know, cause we were just looking at one in Jersey city yesterday. It's like 6.3 million and it's not even that big, you know, yeah. I can help you. Yeah. All right. Yes, go, Lauren. Yeah, you got Chewy down there with that huge facility and right. some others. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would like to move more stuff down there, but it's being practical. It's a little difficult. Michael, do you have a question for Jonathan? Just being in a similar industry, both of you kind of have similar stories, you know, with the amount of time in that field, within the box industry, you're doing different things, but a lot of similarities. Yeah. So do you have any questions for, for Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, I, I probably have a million questions, but I guess one would be, you know, the impetus to move into kind of verticalization you know, of owning the supply chain a little bit, you know, it's very easy for you guys to just kind of be hands off and just aggregate different supply from different vendors. But you decided to get involved in, you know, sourcing, you know, items yourself and, and starting your own kind of direct, you know, brands and labels. And obviously that's a lot more profitable, but it's a lot more, you know, commitment and time and risk as well. So like, what was kind of the decision process behind doing that and, and has it worked out and, you know, what's the path forward for that? Uh, great question. So I think that uh, it's definitely worked out and it made sense uh, primarily from, from a financial perspective uh, for the business. So it, it basically, we got to a certain scale where 
what we could pay for certain types of items uh, from third party brands uh, was really too much. And the economics uh, didn't really make sense for the business. And in an effort to you know, improve the profitability and consistently kind of uh, get more efficient um, is, is uh, you know, we, we tried to kind of outsource that. It's not as um, uh, challenging because we may be handling it in some different ways than, than you may be. Uh, we're really, you know, working with some domestic individuals and companies that are really uh, kind of a full service operation. So when I say that there, Kind of is so we're creating a new brand. Uh, they're creating the private label assets. sourcing. Yeah, they're creating the brand assets. They're they're helping us do the sourcing. They're handling some of the shipping, uh, logistics. You know those types of things. The other thing is is that you know uh, when you're you know so we include in our larger box we include seven to eight items every month, uh, and we're under constant pressure to be sourcing new items and be coming up with different items. And when we're more in control of it ourselves, uh, it, it, it kind of uh, alleviates some of the anxiety around uh, doing that. That doesn't mean, you know, there is an expectation um, from our subscribers that we're competing with companies like FabFitFun, uh, Causebox, uh, you know, Birchbox, very, uh, you know, companies that are much uh, larger than we are. And uh, there, there's kind of a benchmark where they're, they're, you know, setting retail value expectations, expectations on the product. So we still have a need to work with established brands and have some uh, kind of credibility, so to speak, in the box. But uh, it, it's definitely financially beneficial uh, to kind of do it ourselves. And, um, uh, you know, it, it, it just allows us to have more control over, um, you know, what we need and, and just get rid of some of the stress because that is a, a stressful, consistently aspect of the business. Yeah. And then to follow up on that, like, what is, how far out in advance are you looking when you're like putting these packages together and what's like your inventory risk look like? Yeah. Uh, so really for the past couple of years, we've um, been storing at whatever facility we're at right now at Chipmunk, uh, at least 10 items in over like a 40,000 unit quantity at our facility. Uh, so because we've had issues with uh, delivery delays, uh, we've uh, had issues where companies haven't delivered with what they've committed to delivering and they've kind of breached a contract. Uh, type situation. So, uh, you know, we, we need to do that. And we and, uh, you know, those things need to be paid for. Uh, so we've had to kind of invest money into that because we can't kind of float that cost if we take delivery of it, uh, in most cases. So, uh, you know, that's kind of one hedge uh, uh, against that. But typically, we're about, um, you know, four to six months out. And uh, like I was saying, you know, what, you know, with our recent growth, uh, that's been a challenging kind of dynamic because we didn't have enough product uh, to keep up with the demand over the past couple of months. So we pivoted to a welcome box. We've been able to increase um, a lot of orders for stuff for like that we ordered for July and beyond. Uh, so we're going to have more product, uh, but that's, uh, you know, kind of what's happening with that. I want to yeah. ask a personal question. How Michael and Jonathan, and either can answer this or both, how do you handle being happy with growth when you see, you know, 60, 70% of businesses miserable right now? I mean, you have a lot of friends, Jonathan, down here that own restaurants like Kapow Noodle Bar, our friend on the shrimp tank or Oceans 234. They're drowning and it's so hard to have excitement as a business owner. But on the same side, I kind of hold it in, you know, because everyone, it, more people are struggling. So kind of Michael, jo Jonathan, how are you guys either could answer or both? How are you handling that from that approach? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I can jump in real quick. Um, I mean, I just look at our team. I mean, our team has grown from, it started from me alone in, in my house and I brought a buddy in and now we have 65 people and just being able to provide them, you know, a stable work environment every day has been awesome, you know, yeah. and for them to not have to really worry about it too much. Uh, so that's really the driving motivation. You know, obviously, it, you know, there's a lot of, hurt out there and, and businesses that just got the short end of the stick but i owe it to you know everyone on our team to stay focused on what we're doing as much as possible and make sure that they have a place they can come to every day and, and the place that, that's growing we just hired four people over the last two weeks and, and we'll continue to um so so that's really you know i think all that we can focus on and and we're also doing great work for companies to help yeah. you know keep their teams engaged and motivated and excited to come to work every day so 
you know, it, it, you know, obviously it's hard to just ignore some of the other stuff going out there, but you know, right now, you know, the business just requires 120% of my focus. And I think anybody's, you know, business right now just requires that. And the best that we can do, you know, personally is just show up for our, our own team, I think. You know. And Lauren, how are you handling it? You do a lot of work with startup businesses, businesses in general, you know, you're seeing the other side. You're seeing a lot of businesses that can't wait to get the payment protection money. They've gotten it. They don't even know how to spend it because all the rules paying it back are confusing, especially if you're a restaurant. How are you supposed to spend 75% of the money on wages when you can't open up at full capacity? Kind of tell us what you're telling your your clients. So one of the things that we that I'm very vocal about is being very sensitive to other people and the clients you're talking to and your marketing messages because at the end of the day, well, there's, there's a couple of pieces. The first piece is, I will tell you that I'm extraordinarily much more popular being the money lady than the lawyer. Yeah. You know, it's like slap dunk, the money is, wins every time. So now I'm gonna be the money lady forever. So um, anyway, that they call me the princess of pivot. I'm like, okay, that works, whatever. The reality is that I, I think even restaurants, and I work with a lot of restaurants. I've set up a lot of restaurants. I've gotten money for a lot of restaurants. I've, I've worked with tons of restaurants over time. I understand the in, inner, in, inner workings of restaurants and, and hotels and hospitality and massage, I was gonna say parlors, massage places, and that's not a good word. Um, but the, 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 the important thing is to be extraordinarily sensitive to the people you're talking to. Because you, and, and I'm sure Michael, you can relate to this, you, you're doing amazingly well, but you're not like, you know, going and um, kind of making the people, your friends and colleagues feel bad about how well you're doing. You're probably you don't want to be trying cold. to help them with some suggestions that you might have about For how sure. to do better. And you don't want to cold outreach to a bunch of companies without any sort of context and just feeling tone deaf. Like, oh, you should buy this thing, but you're in an industry that is not doing well. Like you, you'll come across as such, you know, like where you don't understand what's going on, you know? Right, and you're a jerk for, if, if that's how you approach it. I think you have to be extraordinarily sensitive to what you're, who you're talking to and the messages that you're, per, that you're purveying, whether it's on Facebook ads, whether it's in person, on Zoom, whether it's whatever it is that you're doing, whether it's um, LinkedIn messaging, you want to be careful about the messages you're sharing and the way that you're sharing them, even your tone, because people are very sensitive. And I will say that having worked with so many businesses that were really and still are really struggling and needed this money, these little bits of money that the, the SBA loan of $10,000, they were desperately clawing at it, like realtors that weren't closing deals and were struggling. And now we've given them a new path. So the reality is it's, it's, a, it's a mindset thing. And if you can be sensitive to the mindset, I think that that makes all the difference, Jason. And I think that that's why these guys are doing so well because they are sensitive to that. So anyone have a question for Surrey? We don't often have you know, her on the show and she's our, our extra guest today. You know, someone's got to have some details that you may want to pick her brain on. Uh, anyone? So I, I, I guess I would say just having some experience uh, in the College of Business and the uh, MBA program, would you say that in this environment and things that have happened, is that spurring more of an interest in entrepreneurship as opposed to kind of pursuing more of a professional corporate career? Have you seen like an uptick in that? that? That's a great question. Thank you, Jonathan. You know, this is something I'm thinking of. The first thing that comes to mind is last night I was talking to one of my former students, Lauren Trombetta, some folks may know her. And I was saying to her, do we know anybody who, who lives in Florida who lost their job in DC and they can come back and they can do the master's program here. They'll get, you know, top, top 11 best education in the country and um, for, for, for pennies, right? You know that the payback rates at our, in our master's programs are some of the best. So to answer that, I think education would be good, but then getting them into the business, uh, oh, absolutely. So now normally those entrepreneurs would be like you and Michael and Lauren, we call them opportunity entrepreneurs. You do it because you see it's the best opportunity, but yeah, you could have done investment banking, you could have um, been in a corporate rep. So now we do see a little bit the necessity 
Um, there aren't the jobs. Firm after firm is even now canceling the internships, canceling the full-time work. Um, but this is a great time. Those assets are cheap. You guys are picking up, I don't know, 40,000 items, but we certainly have lots of good examples. And um, also uh, companies are, are, you know, you just mentioned, Michael, you just hired four people this last week. I mean, great companies are hiring. So I'm hoping we can. Um, I, I was excited to be on this show and and, and also advertise to Facebook because I have many of my former students. I've been teaching for 17 years, probably 10,000 students, not all of them are on Facebook, but um, you know, it's a great, a lot of people are thinking about this too when they get to certain birthdays. So although Michael's already an entrepreneur at 25, sometimes people hit that quarter century and they say, what am I doing with my life? I, I had two I've had plenty of moments like that. Yeah, well, you had them, well, it sounds like from when you were like eight, um, yeah, yeah, I've always been like a few years ahead. <laughs> yeah, but we're excited. And, you know, we really have some great resources here at the university through Tech Runway, the SBDC, our faculty like Roland. Um, so if anybody's out there listening and thinking about it, we can put you in touch. And it sounds like with Entrepreneurs Organization, others you mentioned. So, yes, we're hoping that we get the next generation of business models. And that's the other cool thing is that there's administrative heritage in the time when you can found a company. So not only are you going to get your routines better and bootstrap more, but um, you may just be more alert to Lauren's point earlier, pivoting, um, and that's going to be terrific. So, um, you know, look forward to furthering those conversations. Yeah, I have one, you one don't have question. to be in South Florida. We have a great program online as well. Perfect. That's true. Um, I, had, I had one quick question because I went to William & Mary, which is a very you know historic kind of traditional school. Lots of bankers and consultants come out of it, lawyers, um, but not a lot of entrepreneurs. You know, it's, they're few and far between and, and we all stay kind of close. Um, and I was always kind of frustrated with the lack of innovation there, um, you know, from a programming standpoint, lack of hands-on real world, you know, entrepreneurial expertise. Um, you know, what, how has your program kind of evolved, you know, from an entrepreneurial standpoint and, you know, is there a component of like real world entrepreneurship and, and practicality to it? Um, you know, has that evolved over the last few years? Do you want so, me to get through that one or you want to answer that? Oh, well, well, I would have taken just one piece and then I'm going to get Roland. Well, to Roland knows you. he's built this, but I'll say all schools are on a spectrum and it sounds like, you know, you were at William and Mary at a time and it may still exist where there weren't, um, but I would say that's why I joined FAU. So I had offers at MIT and Yale. I left American University in DC and I wanted to come here because we are doing um, really great things with our students in lots of models. So some are working part-time, some are um, working full-time and also studying. And so we can try to map those. And as Roland points out, these models, we also teach online. So you don't have to be in South Florida. Um, I think, and I, Roland can cover it soup to nuts, but I think we really do it. And I guess the other thing I would say is if you're talking to a young person who's talking about college, and we do this sometimes, and they run, you know, they ramble off a couple of colleges, I'll say, oh, well, there's a great entrepreneurship center director there. You should contact this person and really see if you connect with them and make sure that it's, it's not just on the website or in the brochure, but it's real, right? Um, I noticed in this Facebook feed, there were other entrepreneurship professors jumping in and watching. And, you know, it'd be great if they had a shrimp tank too. But anyway, turning <laughs> it over to Roland. Well, I think one of the things that we're fortunate to have is Scott Adams, who's uh, endowed the center and it operates uh, not within the traditional entrepreneurship curriculum, but it operates boot camp. So anybody at FAU and in the community can come in and, and learn how to take an idea into a business model and, and test that business model and perhaps get into the business plan competition and, uh, uh, see how that goes, but I mean, there's a and there's good mentors we have of uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem or is it ecosystem? I never can figure the eco either. Um, down here is very good. We have great people who are connected to FAU who have come on the shrimp tank, but have also come back and have offered uh, their expertise and mentoring our students. And uh, we have a great progression here. We have a wave program starting out freshmen, sophomores, and perhaps they'll turn their idea into a business, go to the business plan competition, go on to Tech Runway, go out into the community. Jan Bednor is a great example of starting at the business plan competition, Tech Runway, and then 
and then graduating into a great business. So you've got that piece and you have the curriculum as well. And one of the elements of the curriculum that Michael might be interested in, Jonathan too, and, and Lauren, you know, we want to pair up uh, teams of students with local startups in a class and work on a project. We've been doing this uh, class for several years where the students work with uh, an entrepreneur, a small business, a family business, and they uh, work on something that's important to you, but it's not something you can get to right away. So you need some, some hands and eyes and, and folks to kind of help with a particular area that you're interested in. And what is a marketing plan for a new area? Or it could be anything, really, any kind of a project that connects um, with the students and that you can um, use to help grow your business. So there's a curriculum piece and there's the um centerpiece and there's all kinds of things going on here and it's a pretty exciting place to be uh with so many things happening and, and making a difference too i think we're, we're turning out that you know we're turning out successful entrepreneurs not all of them are touched by the adam center or the curriculum but they're touched by fau and the great group of entrepreneurs we have in this community so yeah, that's my sermon make, for today but that's great can i make one more point because this is the difference with fau our undergrad tuition is like $5,200 a year. Compare that to your one-year <laughs> alma mater. Um, and that's one of the hugest barriers for young people is the mountains of student debt. And so they feel like they can't start a business because they're going to have to go to the bank and ask for more. So when I think that's another favor we do to our students. And I know that Roland and I and our colleagues are really committed to that is that um, you can graduate. I, I don't know a single student yet from FAU undergrad, at least with, with a loan. So when you get right out, you can have this great business idea and pursue it. And you don't have like a mountain of debt on your shoulders like a lot of folks would um, because they, they feel pressured. Same thing with the master's programs. Yeah. And to give you guys a lot of credit, because on my end, partnering up, it was easier than trying to go to NYU or Hofstra University where they just ignore your emails. Their professors are not on LinkedIn or social media. And I think what you said earlier is, you know, check out their website, but the website doesn't mean everything. Yeah, they have an entrepreneurship program, but do they have the passion behind it? You know, do they care? And you could see your facial expressions, each of you, when you're talking about it, that you care. And when people reach out, you're willing to take, you know, a call and you're open-minded with the entrepreneur community down here. And, and that's what I went through, right? I knocked on the door. Uh, it started with our other co-host, Kevin Cox, and it was really unique. I said, hey, I had this great idea to start the shrimp tank and I want to partner with the university. And within five minutes, he goes, that's awesome. Let's do it. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't we have to like get some paperwork signed? He's like, nah, let's just go with it. And then after, you know, we figured it out and Roland came on board, he's like, I'll be part of this too. And it was kind of unique to kind of collaborate you know, right away without having to go through all the different hoops where a lot of colleges will force you to do. And then it never ends up happening, right? Two years down the road, it's gone. You know, the opportunity, business owners don't have two years to wait for it to get through a board committee, for example. And then on top of that, look at the Entrepreneurs in Paradise event. We had almost 300 people out there with all of our past guests from the shrimp tank. They all had exhibit booths. But what you did notice is there was a lot of FAU faculty there, a lot of folks from the FAU Tech runway, and they wanted to be part of it. They didn't just ignore the big event that we were throwing at the Boca Raton Innovation Campus. So I think a lot of it comes to really, you know, that end, you know, really caring, not just having a website where things are up there that an entrepreneurship program exists. And I think that's what the younger generation wants. When you look at the millennials, exactly why, you know, Michael, you were mentioning like how they're so into, you know, working 10, 12 hours, they, they, they code all day is this, they want to know that, you know, you care and they see through the BS, right? I think this next generation is like, no way, you know, uh, just because I'm on your website, I don't believe it, right? So uh, I totally agree. Okay, well, so FAU, totally has, FAU has a bureaucracy, but it also has an entrepreneurial culture. Yeah. And a lot of uh, universities, and this is a test point for a lot of universities, whether they're going to survive some of these problems that are going on in society today. And I think what we're always trying to do is to explore new ideas and, and start new ventures, you know, so I think it's a very entrepreneurial group across the entire campus, led by the president of the university, all the way down to us. And even your handle on Instagram, right? Our professor is going to have a handle like the shrimp doctor, you know, many will not. But I'm over 100 over followers now. And, and, <laughs> and that's a great example. Well, guys, everyone, thank you very much for, for coming on the shrimp tank today. For our audience listening, 
You can check out all the 100 plus episodes on iTunes, iHeartRadio, and check all the videos up on our website, theshrimptankpodcast.com. We come live every Tuesday at 4 p.m. So this is your first time checking us out. Make sure to look out for our events once things open back up. We're going to do this big past guest event, hopefully in November again. And uh, yeah, take care, everyone. And uh, definitely check out all these episodes. And if you want to see any of these entrepreneurs' websites, just we'll put them all in the feed on our website. You'll hit the links and uh, check them out on LinkedIn. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond.